deep in the Tasmanian forest lived a ferocious hunter. It once dominated Australia before disappearing completely off-grid. But some believe it's still out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for a chance to reappear. This is the thylacine. Since being declared extinct over 40 years ago, this animal has sparked more controversy and obsession than any other extinct animal. Given that there have been hundreds of reported sightings since it was declared extinct, could it really be that the Tassie tiger is still out there? Before we get into that, let me tell you a bit about the last years of this wolf-like creature. The thylacine was the apex predator of Tasmania until the early 1800s. When European settlers arrived, they quickly labeled these tigers as a livestock killer and a nuisance to farmers, despite evidence that feral dogs and poor land management were actually to blame. This labeling led the Tasmanian government to introduce bounties of one pound for adult thylacines and 10 shillings per juvenile. Estimates suggest that approximately 3,500 thylacines were killed by humans from 1830 to 1920. However, given the numerous sightings and the fact that Tasmania is widely regarded as the last stronghold for the thylacine, with many areas inaccessible to humans, the possibility remains that it could still be out there. Now, if you've ever been interested in the Tassie tiger, you might have seen footage of Benjamin the thylacine. Also known as the Tasmanian wolf due to its dog-like appearance, thylacines are actually marsupials. Their dog-like look is a result of convergent evolution, where different species develop similar traits to adapt to similar environments. This is why Benjamin and other thylacines looked so unique. In the 1930s, Benjamin lived in the Beaumaris Zoo in Hobart, Tasmania. He stayed healthy in captivity until a cold night in 1936, when he was locked outside without shelter and died. The zoo owners advertised and tried to hire trappers to find another thylacine, but none could be found. People soon realized the species was extinct. However, reports of thylacine sightings have continued up to the present day. Some 1,200 or so sightings prompted Barry Brook, a mammal ecologist at the University of Tasmania and his team, to create a database. From this, they published a paper suggesting the thylacine may have survived into the late 1990s or early 2000s. The paper even states, though improbable, data and modeling suggest some chance of ongoing persistence in the remote wilderness of the island. Brooks' team assessed sightings, considering the possibility of fabrication or mistaken identity, giving higher credibility to sightings by scientists or multiple witnesses. Using this model, they concluded that the thylacine likely went extinct closer to 20 years ago, or possibly not at all. They believe a few might still exist in the difficult to access regions of Western and Southwestern Tasmania. While this is exciting, not everyone shares this view. Ecologist Colin Carlson published a paper in 2017, arguing that the survival of the thylacine is extremely unlikely. He believes they likely went extinct between 1936 and 1943, or at the latest by 1960. So, do we have any physical evidence to support these sightings? Well, there are various videos claiming to show a thylacine long after 1936. Even more surprising, many of these videos come from mainland Australia, where the thylacine supposedly went extinct 2,000 years ago. But before we talk about the mainland sightings, let's look at some notable reports from Tasmania. One of the most famous sightings comes from wildlife ranger Hans Nodding in March 1982 in northwestern Tasmania. It was a rainy night, and Hans was asleep in his 4x4 on a remote forest track. He woke up around 2 a.m. and, out of habit, stuck his hand out of the window to swing his spotlight around. The light came to rest on a thylacine about 20 feet in front of his vehicle. Hans had his camera, but as he reached for it, the thylacine walked off into the bush. There are a few notable things about this sighting. Using Barry Brooks' method of determining the validity of a sighting, this one checks some important boxes. The animal was close to the observer, the sighting lasted a few moments, and most importantly, it was made by a wildlife ranger experienced in identifying animals in the Tasmanian forest. The only thing that could have made the sighting better would have been additional witnesses and better lighting conditions. This sighting was taken seriously. By the next night, National Parks officers had set up cameras, which operated for three months without producing any results. 
Over the next 15 months, expert tracker Nick Mooney tried to find paw prints, but again, no evidence was found. The investigation was kept secret for two years until it was announced, unfortunately, without results. This wasn't the first search for a living thylacine. From 1967 to 1973, zoologist Jeremy Griffith and dairy farmer James Malley conducted one of the most intensive searches. They surveyed the west coast of Tasmania, setting up camera stations, and investigated new sightings quickly. But they too found no evidence. Finding a thylacine would be difficult even today. Tasmania is often compared in size to Ireland or Switzerland. However, while Switzerland has a population of 8.7 million and Ireland has over 5 million, Tasmania has about 540,000 people. About half of Tasmania is forested, making it hard to capture a rare animal on camera, especially with the less advanced technology of the 70s and 80s. On the other hand, as time has passed, more people have searched for the tiger in a place where the forest has shrunk, and we still don't have any concrete evidence they are still there. You can look at it from different angles, but many videos and documentaries on the thylacine show that large parts of Tasmania remain very remote. There's an interesting documentary on YouTube by Rob Parsons, where he travels to the southwest coast of Tasmania. In 1938, loggers in this area regularly saw thylacines. Without spoiling the documentary, it shows how isolated and wild some places still are. Searches are not limited to the Southwest. In Search of Real Monsters, Adventures in Cryptozoology Volume 2, cryptozoologist Richard Freeman discusses his trips to find different cryptids, including multiple trips in search of the thylacine. He kept the exact locations he and his team searched a secret, but they explored the northeast part of the island on their first trip and more central areas on the second. Both locations were described as very remote and off the usual paths. What makes Mr. Freeman's approach unique is that he combines traditional methods like setting up camera traps, casting footprints, and collecting samples with interviewing numerous eyewitnesses. These aren't just people who think they've seen a thylacine, but also those who believe they've heard its call. Although there's no recording of a thylacine call, witnesses describe it as a distinctive three-part yap, yip, 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 somewhat similar to a sugar glider, but still different. Mr. Freeman even shared his own experiences of hearing what could be thylacine calls. Now, the fact is, the thylacine is so important to Tasmanian culture that two of them appear on the state's coat of arms. Freeman's book is packed with information about this creature and makes for an engaging read. Before moving on, I want to mention two interesting facts about the thylacine that might be relevant to our discussion on sightings. There are reports of thylacines with very faint or even no stripes. Additionally, thylacines grow a thicker, shaggier winter coat during the colder months, similar to a fox. This may be surprising to some because people always picture them with short hair and prominent stripes, probably due to the famous footage of Benjamin. Speaking of Benjamin, Many sources, including the National Museum of Australia, Wikipedia, the New York Post, the Times UK, the Smithsonian, Australian Geographic, the Thylacine Museum, and various YouTube videos state that the last thylacine was a male named Benjamin. However, this information originated from a single man, Frank Darby, who told the Melbourne Press in 1968 that he was the last curator of Hobart Zoo and that the last thylacine was a male named Benjamin. He also claimed thylacines were mute, which isn't true, and that they used to feed him live rabbits as a public show. Well, it turns out Frank Darby never worked at Hobart Zoo. Tasmanian reporters found a woman named Alison Reed, whose father ran the zoo until his death in 1935, and she also worked there. She confirmed that no one named Frank Darby was ever employed at the zoo and was offended at the idea that they fed live prey to their carnivores as a public spectacle. And lastly, the last thylacine was a female, confirmed by her remains. Many websites and YouTube videos claim that the last thylacine was a male named Benjamin, but this is inaccurate. According to records, the last thylacine was an old female captured in May 1936, who died in September 1936. Interestingly, the most recent footage of a thylacine was supposedly filmed in 1935, indicating that the famous footage might not actually feature the last known thylacine. Moving on to sightings, although Tasmania is most closely associated with the thylacine, the majority of sightings actually come from mainland Australia, 
where the thylacine is thought to have gone extinct over 2,000 years ago. Some of the most compelling footage of a possible surviving thylacine also comes from the mainland. In 1973, Gary and Liz Doyle captured a 10-second clip on 8mm film in South Australia, known as the Doyle thylacine footage. The footage shows an animal running across the road. While it is grainy, the shape seems to match that of a thylacine. In a few frames, stripes appear to be visible on its rump. It has a stiff tail, and it exerts a lot of power from its back legs, consistent with how a thylacine would move. Efforts to enhance the footage with AI upscaling have been inconclusive, but one method to identify a thylacine in unclear videos is by examining the heel. A thylacine's heel is lower on the leg compared to a fox. If the heel is higher, it is likely a fox, possibly with an injury or mange. However, in the Doyle footage, the heel does appear to be lower down. Some people think it might be a dog, since a dog's back heel is usually higher up on its leg. But when you watch different videos of dogs running, it's not always easy to see clearly. Sometimes it looks like the heel is lower down. It's hard to be sure, but maybe there's something important about this footage. Now, let's look at some famous photos from 1984 that supposedly show a thylacine. Kevin Cameron, a tracker, was hired to search for a thylacine in Western Australia after many sightings were reported there. He spent three to five months looking and took five photos that seemed to show the back of a thylacine digging a hole. But of course, this footage too received its fair share of criticism. At first glance, the animal in the photos doesn't seem to have a stiff tail and faint stripes, which are like what a thylacine would have. But critics also noticed a big change in the shadow on the bush behind the animal between the second and third pictures, like a lot of time passed. Now, People think maybe Mr. Cameron moved closer to the animal during the photos, which could explain the shadow change. But looking at the Doyle footage, there's no sign of movement between the pictures, which is odd if the animal was digging a hole. Also, the photos don't show the animal's head. If you've seen a stuffed thylacine before, you might notice the head looks a bit funny. Some think the photos could be staged, or even worse, that Mr. Cameron found a live thylacine, shot it, and set it up to look alive. But Mr. Cameron strongly denies this, saying he cares about conservation and never harmed the animal. Now, let's address the real question. How can there be thylacine sightings if the animal went extinct thousands of years ago? There are three ideas. First, people often mistake other animals for thylacines. Second, some think small groups of thylacines might still be out there in remote parts of Australia. Lastly, some say thylacines might have been brought to the mainland from Tasmania in the past, like the other animals were. No records prove this, but it's possible given the low numbers of thylacines and sightings in Victoria. Back in Tasmania in February 2021, Neil Waters made news by sharing photos of what he said were three thylacines together, a mom, a dad, and a baby joey. Experts like vets and wildlife judges looked at the photos some think there's a good chance, 70 to 80%, that these animals could be thylacines. But not everyone agrees. The photos were also sent to Nick Mooney, an expert at the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery. He thinks the animals are unlikely to be thylacines and are probably padmelons, small marsupials in Australia. Neil Waters disputes this, pointing out features like the tail position and broad feet with four toe pads and claws, which he says prove it can't be a patamelon. Now, onto the Wild Times podcast, where biologist Forrest Galenti proposed a theory. In 1960, archaeologists found a lower jaw of a thylacine in New Guinea, dating back about two million years. Thylacines in New Guinea likely died out around 12,000 years ago, at the end of the Pleistocene period. But Forrest Galenti believes there could still be thylacines alive today. This idea has been around for a while, and Dr. Carl Schuker, a respected cryptozoologist with a PhD in zoology, mentioned unconfirmed sightings of thylacine-like animals in Papua New Guinea and Irayan Jaya. Local tribes talk about a canine-like animal, described with stripes, a stiff tail, and a large mouth. Dr. Schuker notes that New Guinea, especially Irayan Jaya, is less explored than Tasmania or mainland Australia. Recent expeditions to Irianjaya's Foya Mountains have discovered new species, including a giant rat, a tiny wallaby, and a new honey eater. So, what's the final verdict? 
Well, let's look at the facts. Forrest Galenti, known for his fascinating thylacine videos, suggests the extinction of thylacines in Australia was due to humans, dingoes, and climate changes. Severe droughts hit mainland thylacine populations hard, though Tasmania's lack of dingoes might have helped thylacines survive longer there. Regarding Papua New Guinea, much of the area remains unexplored and untouched. Although wild dogs are present, they cannot access some deep valleys or dense rainforest areas ideal for thylacines. In 2016, scientists confirmed the existence of the highland wild dog in the mountains of Papua New Guinea and Indonesia's Papua provinces, an animal not seen in over 40 years. There are three main regions where the thylacine might still exist. Tasmania, mainland Australia, and Papua New Guinea. There are also a few isolated reports from other places like Canada, the USA, and the UK. Cryptozoologist Richard Freeman even wrote about a possible thylacine sighting in Ennerdale, UK in 1810, suggesting they might have escaped captivity. As for the US, there's speculation that escaped thylacines could be behind the legend of the chupacabra, but that's not widely accepted. We genuinely hope thylacines still exist and that we're closer to finding one. However, even before humans hunted them, thylacines were already struggling due to habitat loss and other factors. While some may have survived past 1936, there's still no concrete evidence today. Biologists with PhDs say otherwise, and it's important to listen to their expertise. But one can't help but wonder, what if the thylacine is truly extinct? Well, that's where we might consider Plan B. Perhaps they have indeed gone extinct. Could we bring them back through cloning? You'll be pleased to hear that efforts to bring back the thylacine are in full swing. Ever since Dolly the Sheep was cloned in the 1990s, scientists like Mark Archer from the University of New South Wales have been exploring ways to clone the thylacine. They've gathered DNA from hundreds of thylacine specimens, including pelts and bones. In 2017, researchers at the University of Melbourne even sequenced the entire thylacine genome, which is the most complete genetic map of any extinct species. Now, Colossal, the organization famous for its mammoth de-extinction project, has teamed up with Andrew Pask's lab to bring back the thylacine. They're making strides, focusing on creating detailed genetic blueprints from the thylacine's closest living relatives to guide their engineering efforts. While the science is complex and success might take longer than expected, potentially decades, the project is fueled by optimism and significant funding, including $10 million from the Hemsworth brothers. Despite the challenges, there's also the chance that a living thylacine might be found in the wild before scientists perfect the cloning process. Ultimately, the future of the thylacine remains uncertain. While efforts towards de-extinction continue, some argue that resources might be better spent on conserving existing endangered species. It's a complex debate, but one that highlights our ongoing fascination and hope for the revival of this unique and mysterious creature. Do you think the thylacine still roams undiscovered in remote regions? Or is cloning our best shot at bringing it back? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoy learning about ancient creatures, make sure to hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for more cool stuff about the past.